grace and mercy and peace to you from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We're continuing with our series today, Seven Letters, by taking a look at the third letter, the third church mentioned in the book of Revelation, and that's Pergamum. If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to open them to Revelation chapter 2, starting at verse 12. Now, as is our pattern, let's set the context. Pergamum was a very, another very wealthy city in modern-day Turkey. And stop, let's just stop right there. Isn't it interesting that so far, the cities that we've looked at, where these letters were written, Ephesus, Smyrna, and now Pergamum, were all very wealthy and important cities. Does this say anything? Is there anything just right there that we can glean a little bit and start thinking about, about the way wealth, now either monetarily wealth, worldly wealth, or even wealth in history and in tradition and practices, can sometimes hinder or even just plain get in the way of the full worship of Jesus? In any event, Pergamum was a wealthy city, and it actually competed with the other two cities we've talked about, Ephesus and Smyrna, for the coveted prize of just, of just being the top dog city in Asia. And Jesus called Pergamum the throne of Satan, and he did so for good reason. Pergamum had no less than four temples, at least four temples devoted to worshiping various gods and goddesses. One of them was dedicated to a snake god. And the people who went there worshipped the snake and prayed to the snake god for healing. In addition to the temples, Pergamum also boasted the largest library of the time. It had 200,000 volumes of written information, written material. Now, none of these volumes, though, none of the 200,000, had anything to do with Christianity, Jewish or Christian records. But rather, all of them were about the different philosophies that were out there, gods and goddesses, the late, latest and greatest scientific discoveries and findings, and on and on and on and on. Pergamum itself, has, for industry, was noted for being the leader in the time of the latest and greatest thing, the manufacturing of parchment. And to top it all off, Pergamum was also a big place for emperor worship. You can still go there today and walk on the shrine of the emperor, or of the shrine that was devoted to the emperor Trajan. That's a shrine over here, and on that side is, is the actual emperor itself, a itself, statue of emperor Trajan. And in the middle of all of this were the Christians, the outlawed, hated Christians, who were considered backwards in their thinking. And we were even accused, the Christians then, were accused of being cannibals. Because what do we do? We eat the body and we drink the blood of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The Christians were accused of being cannibals. Now again, Smyrna, Ephesus, Pergamum, I can't help but think how similar these cities are to us today. Here in the state of Michigan, listen to this, there are 93 colleges and universities that are listed under the Carnegie Classification of Institutions of Higher Education. So these institutions here in Michigan include eight research universities, 19 master's universities, 17 baccalaureate colleges, as well as 31 associate colleges. In addition, there are 18 institutions classified as special focus institutions, 11 labeled as baccalaureate associate colleges, five medical schools, five law schools, and two tribal colleges. We have a lot of institutions all around us here in the state. And yet, statistics show that only 19% of the population of the state of Michigan, and that's trending downward, attend any Christian church services in a week. Yet on average, 65% of the population of the state of Michigan has attended some additional schooling beyond high school, including everything from specific trades all the way up to associates, bachelors, uh, masters, and doctorate degrees. Here's, here's the point. We have a lot of smart people running around this state. 65%. 
have advanced schooling or advanced degrees of some sort, but only 19%, and again, that's trending downward, are in church every week learning about Jesus. We're so smart, but we don't know anything. We're not smart about what really matters. Just like the people in Pergamum, with the world's largest library on any and everything under the sun, except the Holy Scriptures. We have very wealthy cities and people who are full of pride because of where they live and, and their work. There's so many opportunities open to us, but the question is, are any of them really any good? Are any of them really worthy? You can make a note of Galatians 5.13. This is what it says. You were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. And that's the problem the Christians of Pergamum found themselves in and after they were rebuked for. They had the freedom in Christ, but instead of living within the boundaries of that freedom, they were indulging in the sinful nature. And this was happening to such an extent that the one person who actually stood up for Christ and said, no, I'm not going to compromise, this was Antipas, was put to death. And records outside of the Bible, ancient writings talk about this Antipas. He was put to death, the ancient writings all say, by being, by being burned at the stake, specifically being stuffed inside of a dead ox and slow roasted over open flames. That's how he was put to death. But don't miss this. The one person out of all the Christians in Pergamum who said no to giving in and compromising on unchangeable truths was killed for it. I mean, here, here's the question. The one, where were the rest of them? Where were the rest of the Christians in Pergamum? In other words, why was there only one person in this church that Jesus called a friend for clinging to his name and the unchanging truth that Jesus brought? Compromise with worldly morality and pagan doctrine was prevalent in the church, and the result was the biblical faith soon became corrupted. Because you see there was one group in the church that said, there's nothing wrong with being friends with Rome. What harm is there in putting a little pinch of incense on an altar and by so doing affirming your loyalty to Caesar and the belief that he is God and worthy to be worshipped? And that's what they would do in these shrines, like the picture of the one we saw. It's how they would say their loyalty to Rome and to Caesar and worship him as divine by putting this little incense on the altar. And there are Christians who say, I know what I believe, but I'm going to get along with the world. I'm going to keep myself safe, so I'll just do it. But I know what I really believe. Antipas refused to compromise. He refused to do this, and because of that was martyred, was put to death, while others took the easy way out, compromised, and went along with the world's practices. Jesus also has it against the church that they hold to the practices of the Nicolaitans and Balaam. And you may remember from our look at the letter to the church in Ephesus, the Nicolaitans were people who called themselves Christians. If they were here today, they'd say, well, sure, I'm a Christian, absolutely. But they weren't. They called themselves Christians, but they said there was no need for the law that talked about pointed to sin to show us the need for our Savior. There's no need to hear about that. And they led Christians to abandon the law engage in any and all kinds of sinfulness, especially sexual sin. They said, in order to master sensuality, you have to know all of it, the whole range, by personal experience, and then you can master it. And so you should abandon yourself without reserve to the lust of the body. The church in Ephesus was praised for kicking them out, for kicking the Nicolaitans out, the Church of Pergamum is condemned for accepting them and bringing them right into the fold, as well as they are also condemned for those who follow the same line of thinking as Balaam, compromising with the world and giving into sinfulness. And you can you can read more about Balaam in Numbers twenty chapters twenty two to twenty five. Here's another note you can make in your Bible: the word Pergamum itself it means married. That's what the word means. What's the big deal with that? 
The big deal is the church is married to Jesus. We are married to the one who saved us. As such, we don't cheat on him. We don't commit adultery on him. We don't cheat on, we don't commit adultery on our earthly spouses. We don't commit adultery with Jesus, the one who saved us, our, our groom, the church's groom. You can also make a note of 2 Corinthians 11, 3 to 4. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the one we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. The question for the Christian church around the world is do we do that? Are we doing that? Do we cheat? Do we commit adultery on our groom by putting up with the things of this world just to get along, even if the things of this world are vastly different from what Jesus tells us in his word? Do we say the same kinds of things that the group in this church said? There's nothing wrong with being friendly to the world. What harm is there in just giving in a little here and a little there, just cooperate to get along? What's wrong is what Jesus says. Repent, therefore. Turn around and stop doing this. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them. I will fight against those who are doing these things with the sword of my mouth. Repent. Jesus says, change your ways and come back to me, Jesus says. Come back to me and be saved. Come out of the world. Come back to me, to my love, to my forgiveness, to the home I've been preparing for you. Law. Don't ever let anyone tell you that Jesus doesn't talk law talk. He does. It's all over the Old Testament and, yes, all over, all over the New Testament, even in the Gospels. However, Jesus also talks gospel. A lot of gospel talk to him. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. What's the hidden manna? What's that all about? John chapter 6, verses 30 to 35 says this. So they, the people who were pestering Jesus, questioning him, they asked him, what miraculous sign, then, will you give that we might see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate man in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives his life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread. I am the bread of life, he said. Why is it hidden? Why is it not here now? It's not here now. It's hidden because he's in heaven. But listen, here's the thing. He's coming back. And this is yet another promise in Scripture about the second coming of Christ. In order for him to give us the hidden manna, he has to bring it to us. He has to bring himself to us. That means he's coming back. And on that day, every eye will see, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And for some, for some it will be too late. They had the chance in this life, but they rejected it. But to those who overcame, those who clung to the faith, they receive a white stone with a new name. What's that all about? The white stone. There's a few different ideas out there on, on what this signifies, but the one, the, the idea, the teaching that I like, and, it, and it's, just, it's just Michael, you can take it or leave it, but the teaching that makes most sense to me is that the stone refers to judgment. Because you see, at that time when people, juries, would judge people, would cast their vote on a person's guilt or innocence, they would do so with rocks. If they tossed in a black rock, that meant they felt the person was guilty. If they tossed in a white rock, it meant that they felt the person was innocent. To those who overcome, those who do not give in, those who do not compromise, those who refuse to take part in all the world's way of thinking, they receive a white stone, judging them as forgiven and Jesus innocent in the eyes of the Lord. A pure bride, 
presented to her husband on the day he comes to take her home. I can't help but wonder about the new name. We've talked in our Sunday morning adult Bible discussions many times about the importance of names in Scripture. A name was, was more than just what you were called. It was a reflection of your character, of really who you are. Abram's name was changed to Abraham. Simon's name was changed to Peter. Saul became known as Paul. Even the disciple John had a name change of, of, of sorts. He went from being a Boanerges, a son of thunder, short fuse, loud, burr kind of guy, to the disciple that Jesus loved, his life now hidden in Christ. What will our new names be? Faithful, beloved, steadfast. Maybe it won't be a new individual name for those who didn't give in. Maybe it'll be the divine name of God, confirming his acceptance and his forgiveness and his love of his children. The saints who overcame the world, the bride who stayed true to her husband, the friends of Jesus, like Antipas, who was willing to lose everything, even his own life, rather than give in and compromise on what Jesus said. Seven letters. Seven letters, seven lessons. The first lesson for us from Ephesus was to love Jesus for who he is for what he's called us to. The second lesson from the letter to Smyrna was to be faithful to the unchanging truth of the word of God without compromise. This third lesson from Pergamon continues with this idea, this theme of not compromise. It's simply this, overcome the world. Overcome the desire to give in, to compromise, to be friends with the world. Now we are to be friendly, yes, we are to love others, but let me ask you, can you love someone but yet still not agree with what they do? Of course, of course. Can you, can you be friends with someone or be friendly to someone and still not align yourselves with them, say, yep, I'm, I'm just like them? Of course, of course you can. That is what we are called to do, love. We're called to love. That doesn't mean always agreeing that everything everyone does is okay or accepting everything that everyone does. Here's the good news. The good news. The good news is we can't do this on our own. That's, that's the good news. The good news is we can't do it. The good news is that it's the Holy Spirit that comes, that gives us faith, that gives us strength to be able to do this, to be able to overcome the world, still live that life of Christian love without compromise. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden man. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. What is your new name going to be? I can't wait to hear mine. Will you pray with me, please? Lord Jesus, thank you again for these letters. Thank you for dictating them to the churches in the book of Revelation. Thank you for loving them enough to call them out in their sin and give them correction. Thank you that we have these letters today to read, to apply, and to grow from. But Jesus, when we're honest, we have to admit that sometimes it's simply easier to do what those at Pergamum were doing and just compromise a little here and there, give in, to be friends with the world, to get along. Help us to never do that. Holy Spirit, give us the faith and the courage to stand firm on your unchanging, timeless truths. Help us to be like Antipas, ready to die rather than negate your word. And thank you for our brothers and sisters in other countries who are setting the example for us of not compromising or giving in to the extent that it is costing them their lives. They are martyrs for the faith of Jesus. Please give them strength and trust in you to continue in the one true faith, even to the point of death. Help us to be like them. Help us to be a pure bride, a white stone of innocence, a friend of yours, Jesus, all because of your work on the cross, your resurrection from the grave. And it is in your name we pray Amen.